My name is Amar Jyot Singh. I'm a education consultant based in Alberta, Canada. And a lot of uh, people asking me questions about how to go to P Canada on a PR, study visa, tourist visa, and other schemes, uh, you know, whatever possible for them. But there is a general notion among people that if they cannot qualify as a direct PR, perhaps they can get a tourist visa and then then they can come here. Is that uh, is that the question that you have? Pankaj is on the line from uh, Muscat. Pankaj, is that you know, more or less the question? What is the question? Yes, definitely, sir. This is the question that I've heard that people who are not successful in getting PR, then they reach there on a tourist visa and after that they make some arrangements or try to be successful in PR. So is that possible? I just wanted to clarify this. Yeah, let me just show you through uh, through a case. I have a, a perfect case uh, for you and for other people who are who are listening to this uh, answer. Uh, I will explain uh, the answer through this case. And uh, what I do is I study court cases of immigration law uh, uh, sometimes all sometimes and you know when when the case arises when when the question arises something like this and I, and I look up a case and I'm here to present to you a case that will give an answer to this question and then you will see. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, definitely I can see your screen. Good. Uh, briefly, this case uh, is about a person who was in a similar situation. He came to Canada on a visitor visa and then while he was here on the visitor visa, he was uh, maybe uh, Start, since from the start searching for a job and then he applied for a job, he got a job, he got the LMIA, then he applied, uh, you know, uh, to get the work permit by going to the border. On the border, there was something uh, Then I'll show you in the case what happened. He was refused and then actually he was deported. So sometimes these kind of uh, schemes of getting converted into a regular status, into a PR status or a change of status, uh, sometimes they are successful, other times they are not. You have to be very careful how to we do this. So let's dive into the case uh, quickly and then uh, and then and then go from there and see what happens. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. All right. So this is this is under the series called misrepresentation. I, I make a lot of uh, collection of cases and this is under series called misrepresentation. Uh, the case is called Singh versus Canada and anybody who's interested, they can copy and paste this uh, link. And then I will also post this link uh, at the below uh, at the screen and then you can go to this uh, screen and then actually read the case on your own. And uh, this was uh, uh, this was, uh, you know, in the Federal Court of Canada, uh, somewhere in the Toronto area. But let's see. Let's see what happens uh, step by step. You can see my screen, right? Just let me know Pankaj, if you can, cannot see my screen. Yes, I'm able to see your screen, sir. Good. It's fine. It's clear. Good. So uh, December 25th, 2017, the applicant arrives in Canada on TRV. I've done some lot of homework and research on this. As you can see, I've made a special, you know, uh, tabulated chart uh, to explain to people. And what was the purpose? What was the purpose of uh, this gentleman to come here? He came here. He wrote in the application form that I have to spend time with the family. So uh, the TRV application at that time from India or or we are not sure uh, whether whether he was hiding the case at the time of application of TRV visa or at the time of extension. He he uh, hid the information that he had welding education and employment experience. So we do not know. And of course, you will see in the court case that, you know, the, the council actually mentioned this. This is a possible hiding of facts, just like other things. Uh, so he came on December um, 25th, 2017. And after about five months, uh, uh, you know, the visa is normally given for six months. After five months, he applied for extension of visitor visa. Do you see that? Yes, yes, I can are see you, that. Are you, able, are you able to follow my sequence? Yes, definitely. It's, it's a right. very good homework you have done. I really Absolutely. like it. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, thank you. So after after about five months, he applies for extension of the visitor visa status. And what is the reason he writes here? I, I'm here to spend more time with the family. The application was extended again. Uh, another six months, which is till November 3rd, 30th, 2000. So you can see the sequence all the way from December uh, till 2018. All right, good. So uh, while while this application was being processed and, you know, um, uh, not only sorry, processed, but finally processed on around 15 October or so, uh, maybe he was searching for the job earlier, but on, around 15 October 2018, 
Uh, he applies for a job. I will not disclose the name of the, but, but that name is listed on the court case. Uh, he applies for the job. He gets a job and he, he gets the job on the same day on the, which the job was offered. He, apply, he he gets a job as a welder. So he was a welder earlier and he gets a job as a, as a welder. Uh, he's also aware. So I'm going by sequence by sequence. This is sequence number four. So he's aware that the LMIA is needed to convert the visitor uh, status into work permit. So he's aware that's that's OK. Now, on February 2019, what happens after about uh, October, November, December, January, February, about four, about four months, he again extends his visitor status with the help of an immigration consultant. What does he write in that extension again? So this is the second extension. So what does he write in the extension? His, extent, his purpose was, I'm here to visit and spend time for the family. He never mentions in that application form that he is actually uh, been uh, offered a job or he's applying for the LMIA or LMIA application has already been the process has uh, started. So he's he has hiding all this information. So nothing was mentioned. All right. Are you with me, Pankaj, so far? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Right. Very good. Good. Mm. So so after one month, after one month or so, after one month of the visitor visa number six, uh, uh, the LMIA is approved on March 12, 2019. And, mm. and at the same time, after about uh, 12 days, he also gets a letter from the immigration that his existing uh, visitor visa uh, status has also been extended for another six months till August 6, 2019. So the visitor visa is now extended uh, and also his LMI is also also was approved in March. So he is ready. So he's got the visitor visa status uh, already, you know, a visitor status in Canada. So he's all, all, already have the LMI. So now he's ready to, uh, you know, get the get the, the work permit. Uh, also, uh, I'm so, I think there's a uh, I think in March M March 12 the LMIA was approved, but it was in pos possibly in April uh, number eight possibly in April the employer tells him that LMI is approved, and that's how that's how you know he knows. So after about one month or so, we do not know what date in April, but on May 2nd uh, May 2nd he he goes to the border. He goes to the the U.S. Canada border, which is Niagara Falls and Rainbow Bridge. Uh, what was the purpose to obtain a work permit? It's called flag polling. So you can do a search on flag polling on Google, and then you can see what flag polling is. That means what you do is go to the border. Uh, they have the uh, the Canada immigration people sitting there, and, and they say, hey, why are you here? And say, look, this is my LMIA. This is my visitor status. Can I get my work permit? So that's what, uh, what happens. But CPSA finds him inadmissible because of misrepresentation, because he was hiding the fact of LMIA application in his earlier visitor visa application. So that is uh, number number nine uh, on this was in, uh, this happens on May 2nd on December 19th. Uh, of course, he must have been very uh, dejected, so he must have come back on in May on that day and he must have consulted some lawyers or immigration consultant and, and they must have said, look, we can challenge this in immigration refugee board, which is uh, immigration division. And uh, on December 19th, uh, there was a hearing in front of a member, which is like a quasi judge uh, of the of the board. And then the judge decides whether it was misrepresentation or not. Did you really hide this? Why did you hide this? Blah, blah, blah. And they look at all those factors and all these all these factors and all these uh, things are given here in the court case. Can you see my next screen? Yes, I can see that. This is the this is the entire uh, you know, 14 page. It tells you exactly what questions were asked and, and pretty much everything. But I will run through the sequence here, and then I'll go go to the main mm, case. This is a very nice synopsis. Yeah, that's right. So, so the hearing the hearing was uh, hearing was conducted on this December nineteenth, uh, and uh, he, you know uh, the applicant the applic So there are two parties now. The applicant may be represented by his lawyer, and the opposite side is the government government counsel who says, "Look, you have misrepresented," and the applicant says, "No, I have not misrepresented," and the judge, the third party. He, uh, he looks at the, both the situation and they decide what is right and what is wrong according to law. So the applicant is claiming, look, I did not have to disclose. The applicant says, look, even though I was filing for visitor visa application, I never had to disclose the LMIA application. That's what he said. Uh, but uh, no, nonetheless, um, uh, the, the, the member of the immigration board decides that, no, you did mis misrepresent and and what happens? They they issue an exclusion order, which is like a de removal order, uh, and you are banned for five years because you lied, 
and you're banned for five years and that's all it is. So after this, this, this happened uh, typically in uh, on the same day, December 19, 2019, and after close to about uh, six months or eight months, uh, he, must, he must have quickly filed for judicial review, uh, you know, point number 11. And the judicial review hearing was scheduled and heard on August 31st, 2021. So it took about a long time, you know, you know, it, it's not easy. Sometimes people say, hey, let's go to the court and get this hearing. I mean, sometimes the hearing also is not, uh, you know, the, the, the dates are not available. And this this possibly happened, uh, you know, in the COVID time in 2020. So the date actually was uh, was conducted, uh, you know, was issued and conducted in August 31st, 2021. The judicial review the, now this is a judicial review that means now a federal court judge is listening to the to the facts so earlier uh, the immigration refugee board had said no sorry you have misrepresented you were hiding a lot of your intent to work here and uh, you know i i find that you are inadmissible i will bar you five years you're deported you should go back to india for five years now it is to the judge to decide the federal court just to decide whether the immigration ruling itself uh, was uh, was uh, you know valid and, and acceptable or not? So here's again uh, item number one. As you can see, I've done a lot of homework and research about this, uh, so that you know people can understand in layman's term what he said, she said. Uh, so the applicant said, applicant says in the in in his application is, hey, my main purpose was to spend family time, but job search was secondary. All right, so that means I'm here to meet my family, but Job search. If I get a job search, that's the secondary purpose. That's not my primary purpose. And I've given a, a number here, but I'll show you the uh, the number paragraph number 27. It's somewhere here. Is it here? And I've made some notes here. Can you see my bunkage? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I can see that screen and the notes also in the yes, font. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, I'm I'm jumping directly to the paragraph number 27. First, the applicant claims that he he inaccurately indicated on the visitor visa extension that he intended purpose was spending with time. The applicant then adds that his main purpose of extending was to remain with his family, but a secondary less compelling purpose was to see if a, if there's a job available, if somebody can hire him. And I wrote my notes, and this is my my notes. All right, then read. Uh, I think I think he's lying. His uh, his 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 purpose was all the way through job search. So many people from India and other countries they think, hey, look, I have a tourist visa. Let me go there, sneak in as a family visit, and then search for jobs, and then get an LMI and get a you know work permit this sometimes backfires i hope i'm i'm coming to the coming to the answer that to the question what you have i mean sometimes we uh, we come on a tourist visa we do not tell the, the the airport immigration that hey look i'm here for a job search i'm not here to visit my mom and my fiance and my friend something my main purpose is job search and there's nothing wrong with it but if you hide it then it, there's sort of problem all right so let me uh, go back to uh, uh that's 27 uh, look at uh, point number two. So uh, what the applicant says is, look, Act 40, which is Immigration Refugee and Protection Act, does not compel applicants to disclose all information. So what I'm saying is, look, I'm not supposed to tell you that I'm looking for a job. This is what it's saying. The Immigration Refugee Protection Act only aims at assessment for the primary and the most compelling purpose of visit. I mean, not the secondary purpose. Uh, do you understand, Pankaj, so far? Yes, it's good. So, so the applicant, applicants are saying, look, your application form for visitor visa extension is asking what is the main purpose of being here, not the secondary purpose. And it is not incumbent on me to tell you everything about my life. Why should I tell you <laughs> for a job? This is what he's saying. And the judge says, no, 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 no. It is not for you to decide what is relevant or not. It is for the immigration to decide. And that's in paragraph number 29. I'll show you mm. here. Mm. Uh, the applicant goes on to suggest that the para 40 of IRPA does not require spontaneous disclosure of all information that might be possibly relevant. He further argues that parliament could have only intended for applicants to be assessed for the primary most compelling purpose. I disagree. Look, and the judge says, I disagree with your logic. And I, I wrote also, this is what I'm writing about the applicant. I think your, your thinking is wrong and presumptuous. You cannot decide in advance what the immigration is intending with that information. It's your duty to di disclose everything and let them decide whether whether we want this information or not. So I'm jumping back to point number three. The applicant says, look, uh, judge, honestly, look, felt, 
you I'm not required to disclose all the possible job offer LMI. In addition, I was not even familiar with the process and specifics. It was the blame the immigration consultant who's responsible. And now the, the first logic is not successful. Then say, look, I am sorry. I am not very educated. I'm not very informed. It's the immigration consultant who was giving me advice. So this is what he says here in paragraph number 33. I will show you in paragraph number 33. Where is paragraph? Yeah, here it is. And he, and he says here that it was uh, here it is. He says that it was the immigration consultant uh, who completed the application. So if nothing else works, blame the lawyer. You know, if I'm if I am naive, if I made a mistake, hey, I did not know it is the immigration consultant who did this. So, you know, they are trying to play that game of, you know, is the immigration consultant who did the mistake. But the judge says, look, it does not matter whether you have knowledge or not. You are responsible for the application contents. And uh, you know he gives certain examples of certain cases which I don't have time to go into this right now. But in previous cases, it was decided whether you are uneducated or whether you have uh, low English or whether you don't understand the legal terms of the application. When you sign the application, you are responsible, not the immigration consultant. So that's what the judge says. All right, so uh, uh, that's it. And if the applicant had disclosed the job application, he would have. No. Yeah, so it is also it is the judge also added that if you had disclosed all the all the, your information about your job search, it is very possible that you would not have got gotten the second extension. That means the the second visitor visa extension, the immigration would have decided. I do not know why you are here. I think you were you said earlier that you are for family purposes. Now you suddenly said you're for job search. And then it is very possible that you would not have received the second visitor visa extension. A judge also says in the at the last is look, if you can, if you come to a, if you come to Canada for a visitor visa permit, that's okay. I mean, and if you, and if you want to change your, uh, you know, uh, things about, you know, whether you want to study or work something, that's okay too. The change is not disallowed, but you have a duty to disclose the change of purpose, and that's what you not did. End of immigration future. Bye bye. Next year, five years. I'll see you after five years. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so coming back, I mean, by the way, this is the case. Uh, anybody who wants to read the case, he can uh, go into Google and type this case, and I can, I can, uh, I can also, you know, leave a link at the at the bottom. the The reason, the reason why I'm why I I had to use this. Uh, let me just uh, block this off and then come back to you on the camera. Uh, let's see. All right. So, uh, so the the reason why I took this case to explain. Uh, the, the nuances of the answer to your question is a lot of people think uh, that if they cannot get express entry, if they cannot get LMI, if they cannot get anything straightforward, they should apply sneak into Canada through a Vista visa. And once they come to Vista visa uh, on a status here in Canada, they can easily uh, maybe, you know, manipulate something, maybe find a job, get admission and change the purpose, you know, immediately change to student status or change to work status or get married or something or apply for humanitarian and apply for refugee. What I what I'm saying through this uh, question of yours is that is wrong. As, I, as the judge said, look, you can change your category, but as long as you do not hide, you were applying for visitor visa extension, but you were hiding all the time that you were applying for the job and you already got a LMIA. This is wrong and we will penalize you by by giving you a removal order. And this is what I had uh, to use this case to uh, to describe. You can you can do anything uh, on a visitor visa, but do not hide anything. That's all I have to say. Any questions? So, had he disclosed at the time of second extension, had he disclosed the right purpose that he got the LMA, he would have been in a better position today. Ab absolutely, and not only better position. I I would have argued that he would have actually also got the work permit successfully because it is not wrong to search for a job. It is not wrong to look for a job. It is not wrong to take a job interview. But if you could have just mentioned on the second visitor visa application, look, I'm here to visit my family. My family is here. I'm being taken care of. My food, boarding, lodging is covered. I have money to stay here for longer. But by the way, I attended a job interview and I was offered a job and LMI is also, uh, you know, is successful. I have the LMIA. I, I want to get additional time, maybe three months, four months, six months time. 
to enable me to convert from Vista status to work from a status. Nothing wrong with it. Maximum loss could have been if it look the worst come worst situation if it was refused. If the second Vista visa application was refused, he could have easily left Canada, went back to India, and then he could have applied for a work visa from there. But at least he would have been successful uh, either way because he was truthful uh, in that application, and that would would have. Uh, meant you know maintenance of that credibility because once you lose credibility with immigration, you are you are done. You are you are your chapter is over. Mm. Actually, that was about I was about to ask the same thing. Had he gone back before the second extension, then he also he would have been able to come back. So you absolutely. already answered. Yeah, you absolutely. already answered that question absolutely. too. Absolutely, yeah. I have no doubt. I have I have I have personal examples of I've done some applications where I have uh, I mm. have listed. I, I'll tell you some other example if you if you have interest in immigration law. Uh, in one of the in one of the visitor visa extension application, I I listed there that my client wants to get six more months. Why? Because because he is in a relationship. He will get married after three months or four months. Mm -hmm. And why after three months? Because right now he does not have the money. But he wants to plan ahead. He wants to do some arrangement and, and other things and invite friends and something. So. Hey, by the way, I want to get an extension. We will get married after three months. And after marriage, I plan to file a spousal sponsorship leading to PR. So my intention is clear all the way. And lo and behold, we got the extension because I have nothing to hide. Not only extension, but when the time comes for spousal sponsorship, they can see the track record of the communication and how it was building up. So everything went, went out very, very nice. I, I sometimes I'm very dreadful of a lot of people uh, who are coming from overseas and they cannot get the study visa or maybe they, uh, you know, or they are mature uh, candidates. They are 35 plus, 40 plus, 40 plus, and a lot of consultants in those countries tell them, look, why don't you get take the visitor visa? Maybe study visa is, is difficult for you. Why don't you get the visitor visa? Come to Canada and then I will convert your visitor visa study visa. That's the same scenario as we just saw. As soon as you get the visitor visa and you come here and all of a sudden after one month or so, then you convert into study visa, uh, study permit status. I think immigration is bound to be suspicious. What was the intention? I mean, were you thinking about study permit all the way along when you applied for visitor visa? How, how all of a sudden you got the uh, intention of you have the money, you have the ILTS and now you got the admission and now you're given an application for study permit. So I think it borders on misrepresentation. That's why that's why I don't like hiding. I mean, if, if somebody has to apply for study permit status, when you apply for visitor visa in your country, tell them, look, I'm applying for visitor visa status because I do not know what Canada is. I will go to Canada. I will visit some college or university. Then I will decide maybe I want to become a student. Perhaps not. I'll come back. What's the what's the difference? Indeed, indeed. Yes, you've got to be honest. Yeah. Understand that. Yes. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, for your questions and uh, uh, and for the chance of you know explaining the case. And uh, I was uh, looking to use this case to describe my answer so that a lot of other people can also benefit and you know take advantage uh, of this case. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for no, your time. Th yeah. Thanks to you also for educating us.